Hello, we'll continue our discussion of phosphorus and for the next few minutes I'd like to focus on agricultural management practices for minimizing phosphorus contributions to surface water bodies. By far the most important agricultural management practice for reducing the impact of phosphorus on surface water quality is soil conservation. Keeping our rich fertile cropland topland topsoil on the landscape, minim minimizing the amount of runoff that's leaving our agricultural fields. These are all critical to reducing the potential for detrimental impact of phosphorus on surface water bodies. There is a lot of research conducted over a long period of time, uh, decades, 40, 50 years, looking at the impact of various conservation practices on phosphorus uh, movement to water bodies. I'm just going to share with you one quick study that illustrates uh, the trends I'm talking about. This is some research done in Wisconsin uh, looking at concentration and loss of soluble P. Remember soluble P is phosphorus that's immediately available to aquatic weeds and algae once it hits a surface water body. Here we're looking at the impact of tillage systems, specifically conservation tillage systems, till plant, chisel, no-till, compared to moldboard plowing. Remember in the part one of this discussion we talked about concentration of phosphorus versus load or loss of phosphorus. Here we're comparing every, our, our losses and our concentrations of phosphorus to moldboard. So everything is relative to moldboard plowing. In terms of concentration or the amount of phosphorus per unit of runoff that's leaving the landscape, you can see our conservation tillage systems are actually higher than moldboard systems uh, due largely to their crop residue in terms of the amount of dissolved phosphorus that's contained in the runoff. However, because we're significantly reducing runoff loss and soil loss with these conservation tillage, you can see the parameter that matters, the phosphorus loss or phosphorus loading, is significantly reduced with all these conservation tillage systems relative to moldboard plowing. So conservation tillage systems are one of many uh, erosion control and runoff control practices out there for reducing the loss of phosphorus from agricultural uh, landscapes. Other important parameters are management practices for phosphorus are soil testing. You know, soil testing is critically important for assessing the inherent fertility of the cropland fields we're dealing with and soil testing can serve that function along with a couple others. As I mentioned, measures the uh, inherent fertility of the soil. Soil testing will also track our fertility and produc production trends over time. You know, we can monitor whether we're building up soil fertility or whether we're drawing down soil fertility. An added bonus of soil testing, uh, all the fields on a given farm, are um, it identifies fields that do and do not need nutrients. This is a, a big plus when it comes to distributing manure on a farm. If you can identify lower testing fields that we can get to, these might be great places to prioritize future manure spreading uh, applications. Interpreting our soil test phosphorus results, We'd like to keep our soil test values in the optimum range and for the major crops of alfalfa, corn, and soybean, you see our optimum level of soil test phosphorus expressed in parts per million. Our excessively high or categories where we get no response are illustrated here too, greater than 35 parts per million for alfalfa, 30 for corn and soybeans. So we want to shoot for optimum. Uh, we probably don't want to go much higher than our uh, excessively high or non-responsive fields. Uh, crop need for phosphorus as well as for potash or potassium. They're based on two parameters. Our soil test result, which is coming off of our, um, the soil samples we submitted to the lab, and crop yield. This is a cutout of a portion of the phosphorus recommendations for corn. You can see they're based on the soil test level. The lower we are in terms of soil test uh, phosphorus, the higher the need for supplemental phosphorus fertilizer is going to be. It's also based on yield goal. The higher our yield goal, the higher our demand for phosphorus is going to be. So again, we're shooting for soil test levels at optimum. We'd like to keep them there. If we're in this optimum soil test level, we're going to apply commercial fertilizer <clears throat> or some supplemental uh, nutrients at a rate more or less equal to crop removal with the goal of staying in this optimum range. Um, a word about yield goal. Uh, yield goals should be realistic. Uh, we want folks to be optimistic to, a stand, to, to an extent, 
Uh, in this era with uh, yield monitors on, on most combines, it's a lot easier now than it was a few years ago in getting uh, field-specific uh, yield measurements from fields. A realistic yield goal could be 10, maybe 15 percent uh, higher than the running multi-year average for a given field. So, um, you know, we don't want to assume we can grow 250 bushel acre corn in Ashland or Bayfield County. Uh, we want these Yugo estimates to be based on what's happening on the field with a little optimism thrown in. Uh, assessing variability, another use of the soil test results uh, for a given farm. Here you see soil test phosphorus uh, distributions across the dairy farm in Washington County. You'll see highs and lows on this farm. This gray bar here illustrates the optimum soil test phosphorus range for the crops that this farm grows. Uh, this is where we want to be, ideally, for more star fields if we, if we could achieve this. Um, you see the soil test results identify some fields where we could go with supplemental fertilizer or more likely on this dairy farm with manure to try to build up soil fertility levels and fields we should stay uh, away from. If I could see you in person, I'd ask you to raise your hand or volunteer an answer that on why these fields in this dairy farm are so high in soil test phosphorus. And I can see you nodding through the screen already that, uh, you know, if you had to guess which of these fields were uh, closest to the barn, I think you'd probably be able to figure out that 9, 10, and 11 here are close to the farm and have received most of the manure in the past and as a result have elevated levels of soil test P. Uh, we can use this type of data as a nutrient management planner, as a crop consultant, to convince the farmer to hopefully, if they can efficiently and safely get to these other fields, start applying manure to these fields to build those levels up. Now a lot of times there's practical limitations with how far you can get uh, to a field um, reasonably and safety concerns. In this case with this farm there's a major highway bisecting the farm and there's probably some, there is some very good reasons why these fields are low and, and aren't manured on a regular basis. Cell test phosphorus, it doesn't change quickly. Um, Carrie may have talked about in her webinar presentation, or you may know, about a soil property known called uh, buffering capacity. Buffering capacity is the ability of a soil to immobilize or tie up nutrients that are applied to it, uh, meaning uh, in abbreviated terms that just because we add X units of fertilizer to a soil doesn't mean we're going to get X levels of increase in soil fertility. Uh, this, this amount of fertilizer needed to change a soil test level either up or down by a given amount, in this case one part per million, is called the soil buffering capacity. For phosphorus and uh, our medium and fine textured loamy soils in Wisconsin, it takes eight pounds of fertilizer or fertilizer equivalent P2O5, excuse me, did I say eight? I meant to say 18 pounds of P2O5 to equate to one part per million in the soil test phosphorus value that we measure through soil testing. So again, take home point is times required to either raise or low, lower uh, soil test phosphorus levels and there's a, an example here I'd like to show you about uh, phosphorus drawdown over the course of a six-year rotation on a farm. Let's say we're starting out uh, in year one of this rotation with a soil test phosphorus level of 75 parts per million. That's excessively high for the crops we're growing on, on, this, on this farm. We're going to track the drawdown of phosphorus over this uh, six-year rotation where we're growing two years of corn, one year of oats, and three years of hay. We know the crops are going to remove, you can see corn is going to remove 60 pounds of P2O5 per acre per year, oats 25, alfalfa 65 at, at a 5 ton per acre year, uh, over the, at a 5 ton per acre uh, yield. Over the course of this six year rotation, you'll see that the amount of P2O5 we removed over the rotation is 345, excuse me, 340 pounds of P2O5. That 340 pounds divided by the buffering capacity of that soil, of that soil is, which is 18, would result in a 19 parts per million change in soil test phosphorus. Well, that 19 parts per million subtracted from where we started out at the beginning, six years ago of 75 parts per million, will drop us down to 56 parts per million soil test phosphorus, which is still 
excessively high for this soil. So even after a six-year rotation of applying no phosphorus, no phosphorus to commercial fertilizer, no starter, uh, no phosphorus in the manure, we're still at excessively high levels because it takes a while. It takes time to draw down soil test P values. When we talk about uh, potassium, you'll see just the opposite side of the story. Soil potassium values will change very rapidly, but with phosphorus, it takes time to build them up. It takes time to build down soil test phosphorus values. Manure and manure management uh, impacts phosphorus. There's uh, lots of techniques for uh, utilizing manure. You know, one of the most important is placement of manure on the on the landscape, identifying fields that are going to have minimal soil loss and minimum losses of runoff to try to keep that manure on the soil profile. Uh, I've been in this game now for 25 years and one of the uh, best observation I have of uh, agriculture is the uh, changing in the mindset or the realization of the value of manure. I think when the fertilizer prices uh, blew up uh, in 07, 08, and 09, uh, and, and before that because of nutrient management planning and other techniques, the, the nutrient value of manure and using manure as a fertilizer commodity increased. And, uh, you know, farmers are more convinced of the fertilizer value of manure now than ever before. When we're applying manure on our cropland fields, we can follow one of three strategies. A strategy that utilizes the nitrogen in the manure more efficient, efficient in the, to the greatest efficiency is one. Uh, another second strategy is a strategy that utilizes the phosphorus in the manure to its greatest level of efficiency. And the third strategy, which we don't like to talk about, is the dump and run and forget it manure, uh, manure application strategy. Fortunately, that strategy, the third strategy, is becoming a, a thing of the past, uh, thanks to you, the CCAs and all of you involved in nutrient management planning. When we're, uh, a couple things about when we're comparing the nutrient content of manure with crop removal, specifically with corn. Corn utilizes about three times more nitrogen than phosphorus in the plant. However, manure applies nitrogen and phosphorus at more or less a one-to-one -one ratio. So the result is if we're applying manure to meet the nitrogen needs of the crop, we're going to be building up soil test phosphorus levels over time. Again, not a bad thing uh, as long as we keep that enriched soil on the landscape and minimize runoff, but we need to be aware that phosphorus levels will increase over time if we follow this nitrogen-based strategy, which is illustrated here, uh, of applying manure to meet the crop's nitrogen need. Here we're looking at manure application rates of 60 tons per acre, uh, the crop nutrient need for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is illustrated in these blue bars. The nutrients that are applied by the manure is illustrated in these um, gold or bronze bars. You can see when we follow this nitrogen strategy, we meet the nitrogen needs of the corn, we over-apply phosphorus, and we over-apply potassium. Potassium, on a typical dairy rotation, we draw that down. We won't worry too much about that. With phosphorus, if we follow this strategy over a few years, we won't draw down that phosphorus over the course of the rotation as we just looked at, and we will start building up soil test phosphorus value levels. This nitrogen application strategy is the one that most producers prefer because it allows them to spend less time on the tractor and apply more manure to fewer acres. You get to go with higher rates. You're going to build up P and K in excess of crop need. It's efficient in terms of time and labor, and, it, and it's preferred when land resources for spreading are limited. If we were to follow a phosphorus-based strategy, we'd have to lower our manure application rate to the equivalent crop removal, uh, phosphorus removal uh, of the plant we're growing, in this case corn. You see we'll hit that phosphorus level, but we'll be under-applying uh, nitrogen. Uh, still applying some excess potassium but again, we will remove that later in the rotation. So in this case, we have to go back out with supplemental nitrogen fertilizer if we were only applying at phosphorus rates. From a nutrient efficiency standpoint, this phosphorus strategy gives us the maximum efficiency, but applies at low rates. Uh, we need to, on our corn ground anyway, need to go back out there with supplemental nitrogen. Uh, there's increased time and labor. We need more acres. and. Are we likely to protect water quality with this strategy? We don't know, but uh, fortunately there's some uh, 
practical allowances in management recommendations, including the 590 standard, that allow us to apply manure to meet this phosphorus strategy um, and, and make this strategy more acceptable. And that is by applying our phosphorus, our manure-based phosphorus for the entire crop rotation in a single year. So rather than applying these low rates over multiple years in a cropping rotation, we can apply the phosphorus demands of our crop rotation over a single or in some cases two applications over the cropping rotation. Uh, it's allowable under the 590 standard and this often makes a phosphorus based strategy for manure applications more acceptable pr to producers as they're um, taking manure out to the field. Soil test phosphorus limits, there's sound agronomic uh, recommendations for when and how we should uh, apply manure on fields based on soil test phosphorus values. These criteria are also contained in our 590 nutrient management standard uh, as critical values, soil test phosphorus values for manure spreading. Uh, if our average soil test value for a field is under 50 parts per million, which is still excessively high for most crops, we can apply manure to meet the nitrogen needs of the crop, meaning we can apply at these larger uh, manure application rates. Uh, if we're in that range of 50 to 100 parts per million, the 590 standard and our UW Rex have asked us to apply uh, phosphorus through manure at rates that do not exceed crop removal. You know, we want to keep soil test P values where they are by applying manure at rates equal to phosphorus removal. Uh, the flag goes off, the red flag goes up when we're over 100, red, uh, excuse me, 100 parts per million soil test phosphorus there. If possible, those fields should have manure applications eliminated and any other supplemental forms of phosphorus. Uh, there are some exceptions in the 590 standard. If we're growing a high demand phosphorus crop, you can apply more. If the producer has no other option, uh, they are allied, allowed to spread manure on these higher testing fields, but they are supposed to apply that manure at rates below crop removal so that over time we will be still drawing down the soil test phosphorus levels. And there is a third option, which we'll talk about later, which is using the phosphorus index model. Again, I'll explain that in a moment, but that's a landscape model that looks at the potential for phosphorus to leave a field. If that value is relatively low, you can get away with applying manure on these higher soil testing P uh, fields. So we'll take a break here and come back with one more discussion of soil test phosphorus. Thank you.